Um, well, hi, everybody. So uh, welcome back. Um, I hope everybody had a good break. And uh, yeah, I had a I had a really great break, actually, because I got engaged with my girlfriend. So yeah, um, I mean, I hope everybody's was really good as well. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks. So, um, yeah, anyway, I, uh, I guess we're now going to talk about linear algebra. Um, so it's, uh, lecture 19. Um, and um, we're still in chapter six. So, so last time, we, um, you know, we introduced all these new concepts uh, that introduced geometry into, into linear algebra. So we talked about dot product, uh, orthogonality. So we talked about orthogonal vectors, we talked about or orthogonal sets of vectors. We talked about orthogonal basis. That's a special kind of basis where every pair of vectors is orthogonal. And then we talked about uh, orthogonal projections. Onto a subspace. And this is a very important concept for this lecture. So let me just remind you what it is. So if you're given uh, a subspace uh, w contained in Rn, uh, and you have some vector y in Rn that may not be in the subspace, uh, then uh, the orthogonal projection is um, is a vector, it's a following vector in the subspace. Um, the projection onto w of y, uh, you can compute it using a formula once you have a basis of W. So let's say this has an orthogonal basis. Uh, so let's call, let's say subspace has an orthogonal basis. Uh, U1 up to UP. Uh, then the projection of Y onto W is has this formula. Um, so it's a, it's a linear combination of the basis vectors and then the coefficients are just given by dot products. Sorry, this parenthesis should be, should be a little bit different. Um, and this vector, you know, this is the vector that we called y hat in the last lecture. And this vector is always in the subspace, regardless of whether or not y was in the subspace. And uh, the formula depends on the orth orthogonal basis, but we'll see in a moment that no matter what basis you choose, you get the same project vector y hat. And this the important properties um, were that uh, this has the best approximation property so this y hat is the closest vector. So this minimizes the distance y hat minus y among all you know vectors in W. So it's the closest vector. The second property is the unique decomposition property, uh, which says that um, uh, uh, the decomposition uh, y. So if you had y as y hat plus z, um, where where z is uh, z is just well z is just y minus y hat. Um, so this is equal to the projection of w onto y hat. Uh, uh, onto W of Y, sorry. And this Z is equal to the projection 
onto the orthogonal complement of W of Y. Uh, so this decomposition uh, satisfies, uh, well, okay. Uh, satisfies that Y hat is in W and Z is in the orthogonal complement and is unique. So there's no other way to write Y as a sum of one vector in Y hat and a vector in, uh, as a vector in W and a vector orthogonal to W. So this is a summary of what we did last time. And you know, there's, yeah, there's this sort of picture that goes with it that you have the subspace W, you have the orthogonal subspace W perp, and then now you have some uh, some vector uh, y that I was drawing in blue, and then you know this y hat is actually just a projection of y onto w, and then the vector z is just y. Oh, sorry, it should be is just y minus y hat. Okay, so that's a summary of the end of the last lecture. So any questions about that? This 90 degrees is very important. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is, so notice in this formula, it was very important to have an orthogonal basis. So today we're gonna do two things. One is I'm gonna tell you how to find an orthogonal basis for any subspace. Uh, this is something called the Gram-Schmidt process. It's the content of section 6.4. It's quite simple, it's just another algorithm. This is how to find orthogonal basis for any subspace. And the second thing is that we're gonna use this to enhance our notion of solving linear equations to be something a bit more general, which is very useful in practice, that's called least squares. And you may have heard of this if you took statistic. Uh, statistics or, yeah, for example. So, um, yeah, so somebody asked, why is this formula, you know, why is the projection independent of the choice of basis? I will prove that on the next slide. You will get that. Um, actually, you know what, before I get to these, I might as well do that. Okay, so, 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 so let, before I get to these two things, let me make a few last uh, remarks about what we just did. Or, 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 maybe, or maybe there's some uh, additional properties, let's call them. Of the orthogonal projection. So, um, so, so, so one is uh, that uh, this is uh, that, um, uh, so if you look at this formula on the previous slide, sorry, I can turn this off. If you look at this formula on the previous slide, I can rewrite this formula in matrix notation, and that will give me a few nice properties of um, uh, of the of the orthogonal projection. Um, so one is so so suppose W is a subspace. And suppose it has a basis U1 through UP, orthogonal basis. Uh, then if I, if I write this projection onto W of Y, uh, well, it's a linear combination, right? So, or, or actually, you know what? Let's assume it's an orthonormal basis. So that means that the vectors are unit vectors. So then the formula simplifies a little. This is just y dot u1 times u1 all the way up to y dot up times up, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write this in matrix notation. So let's introduce a matrix u, which is gonna be an n by p matrix, which is just gonna contain these things as columns. Okay, so now this is just a linear combination, right? So I can write it as a matrix vector product. This is just a linear combination of U1 through UP. So it is equal to this matrix with columns U1 through UP. 
times a vector whose coordinates are, you know, these dot products. Right? Now, um, these dot products, so this is the new thing. I can write that as a matrix vector product as well, but now in a different way. Let's now consider the matrix U transpose. So this is a P by N matrix whose rows are U1 through UP transpose. Okay, so this is something we haven't really been doing in the course so far, looking at transpose. Okay. Um, and now, remember, the dot products are just multiplication by transpose. So you can actually write this as this matrix U1 through UP times this matrix with the rows being U1 transpose through UP transpose times the vector Y. So I'm using both interpretations of matrix vector product here. One is the linear combinations interpretation and the other is the high school interpretation where it's just dot products of the rows. And so actually this tells me that this is just equal to U times U transpose times Y. So that's the matrix formula for the, for the for orthogonal projection. Okay. And you know, this makes sense, right? This is an N by N matrix because it's an N by P times P by N matrix. This is an N by N matrix. And this is the matrix, this is the standard matrix of the linear transformation that is the projection, right? So we're, we can now think of, we define this operation, projection, orthogonal projection. What we're realizing is that it's actually a linear transformation. I mean, this is a proof of that, right? I just showed you that the projection onto W of Y is literally some matrix times Y. So it's a linear transformation. So any questions so far? Okay. Sorry, Professor, I have missed this, but what is the U stand for? The U and so the, the U one through UP are the, are the uh, orthonormal basis vectors. Oh no, uh, the uh, big uh, capital U's. Oh, it's a matrix containing them as columns. It's oh. in the box on the right here, see? Thank you. Yep. And U transpose is a matrix containing the row vectors as rows. Is this only possible with orthonormal or? Yes, only orthonormal because this formula is simplified, right? There are no denominators. That's because all the vectors are unit vectors. Okay. So what this particular formula is only for orthonormal bases. Uh, I have a small definition question I want to clarify. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the matrix U is called orthonormal matrix or auth like uh, Right, so, so, so I'll get to that. So there's a confusing terminology, uh, which, yeah, maybe you read the textbook. So there's a confusing terminology. So if you have U as an N by N matrix has orthonormal columns, it is called an orthogonal matrix. Okay, now this, this terminology, this is not a new concept, it's just a new terminology. This matrix has to be square for this to work. Okay, so what we've written here is not an orthogonal matrix. Even though its columns are an orthonormal basis of a subspace, they actually, unless there are N of them, unless it's an orthonormal basis of all of our N, it's not called an orthogonal matrix. Maybe that's what you're asking about, right? Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, it, it does. I mean, you. I find it confusing. You may not. Uh, but anyway, but let's focus on this concept. Okay, so it's a linear transformation. So that means we can now ask all kinds of questions that we asked, uh, you know, that we thought about before, right? So, so we have this linear transformation, 
projection onto W. So remember now there's a fixed subspace W. And let's say it has a basis U1 through UP, orthonormal basis. And now this defines a linear transformation from Rn to Rn, right? Um, now, uh, one question is, um, uh, what's the kernel of this transformation? So what's the set of vectors whose projections onto W are zero? So what is it? Anybody have a succinct description of it? Is it the set of vectors W? Yeah, it's just W perp, right? It's a set of vectors, because remember, if your projection onto W is zero, you know, what, what does that mean in terms of this decomposition theorem? Well, it means you're equal to your projection onto W perp, right? So you have no component in W, which means you're orthogonal to W. And it's sort of intuitively clear from this picture, right? That if I have my, if I have a Y, the only way for me to get zero is if my Y looks like this and it, it really is orthogonal to W. So the kernel is just W perp. What's the range? So if I if I do the orthogonal projection, right? What uh, you know? Again, looking at this definition, what do I get? Like the the vector y hat, where does it live? W. W. w yep. Yeah. And can I get all of W? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Why? Well, because you can choose any vector that can project onto the pole. Like there can always be a vector which projects onto a point in W. Okay. For such as what? So suppose I give you a vector in W, right? Suppose I give you a vector here. Let's call that vector little w. Uh, so suppose w is in W. Can you uh, can you can you tell me some vector whose projection onto w onto the subspace w is that vector? Itself. Itself, yeah. Right. If w if little w is in w, then the projection onto subspace of little w is just itself. So actually, the range is just equal to w. And so you know you can draw many conclusions from this. One interesting one is. Uh, what's the sum of the dimensions of these things? N. Yeah, it has to be N by rank nullity. Right? So if one of them is big, the other has to be small. So we, we use this fact in this. Uh, okay, let's connect it to some other concept we know about. Uh, what are the eigenvalues? So, so, so let's let uh, A be the matrix of the projection onto W, standard matrix, which is just this matrix U, U transpose, right? Uh, what are the eigenvalues and what are their eigenspaces? Any thoughts? Um, would we have uh, an eigenvalue of one for all vectors within W because they just get mapped to themselves? Yeah, right. So, so the first observation is if X is in W, then, uh, you know, AX just equals X, right? Because projecting a vector in W onto W doesn't do anything. And so what that means is that there's an I, the eigenspace with lambda equals one is just equal to W. Right. Any other eigenspaces you can see here? Eigenspace of zero is W perp. 
yeah. If x is in w perp, then projecting onto x just gives you zero, right? So that means the eigenspace of zero is w perp. And I claim that that's everything. Why is that everything? Because that spans Rn. Yeah, the sum of the dimensions is n. So there can't be any more eigenspaces. Okay, these are all the eigenspaces. So the so uh, orthogonal projections are among my favorite linear transformations. I think about them a lot. And the mat matrices of orthogonal projections are very simple in terms of eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are just zero or one. Okay. Now, somebody asked a question, why doesn't this depend on the choice of basis, right? Well, the answer actually goes back to these properties. So it, one way to prove, I mean, you can use either of these, right? So the projection is the minimizer. Uh, so, 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 you know, the projection is the minimizer among y hat of the distance to y, right? That def that property doesn't depend on the choice of basis, right? I can talk about this property of being a best approximation without ever mentioning a basis. I just need the subspace. Similarly, by this unique decomposition property, I can actually, you know, write the second property without mentioning a basis. There's no mention of a basis here, right? So both these properties are independent of the choice of basis. both of these properties. So what that means is if I, if I had some other basis and I computed the projection with respect to that basis, it would have to be the same, same vector, right? Because I have to satisfy these properties and these properties uniquely determine the vector. So that's the reason why, even though the formula depends on the basis, the projection itself, the linear transformation doesn't depend on the choice of basis, even though it looks like it does, right? You could you could have many different u, but what we're saying is that u u transpose will always end up being the same thing for all of those orthonormal u. So, any questions about that? Um, professor, could you explain why u u transpose is going to be the same for all bases? Uh, that's right. So, um, so so let me just write it here. So the claim. So the project, this linear transformation uh, doesn't depend on the choice of uh, u1 through up. Okay. Now, now the reason for that is because of the because let's use this use unique decomposition because the unique decomposition property says that the projection is unique. There's only one vector y hat satisfying this property, right? So if you were to choose some other basis u prime, then you know that y hat uh, that you get from that basis would also satisfy the unique decomposition property. But the key is that that decomposition is unique. So that y hat has to be the same y hat. So by a unique decomposition. So this this partly this doesn't fully answer the question. This just says that the projection itself doesn't depend on the choice of basis. Does is that part clear? I'll get to UU transpose in a moment. Yes. Okay. But now what about UU transpose? Well, UU transpose is a standard matrix of this, right? But because the linear transformation doesn't depend on the choice of basis, neither does this matrix. Does that answer the question? So, so this is a this is a cool fact. It's not supposed to be obvious, and the proof of it really follows from these two properties that we established last time, right? 
the best approximation or the unique decomposition property because those don't depend on the choice of basis and they uniquely determine y hat. Because um, when we look at the matrix U, the columns are the basis that we chose, right? Absolutely, yeah. So this is the beauty, right? That U obviously depends on itself, right? But U, U transpose doesn't. Okay. When you multiply by transpose, you always get back the same thing. Okay, thank you. So th this is like a, um, it is surprising. You should be surprised. Um, does that mean that if we use different bases, we'll have like a different, um, like our projection will be in a different coordinate system? And then like, is or are they just going to be like the exact same? No, they're going to be the exact same. This is all being done in standard coordinates, right? Hmm. So we're not doing any change of coordinates here. So th this this is sort of the surprising thing that the formula depends on the choice of u, but because of the properties as a function, the projection doesn't depend on the choice of u. And therefore, I mean, you know, uh, somewhat magically, u u transpose doesn't depend on u, as long as u is an orthonormal basis of w. That is important. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so that's all I want to say about this for now. But now that we've talked so much about orthonormal basis, I want to move on to item one, Gram-Schmidt, which is how do you get an orthonormal basis for a subspace? Okay, so uh, let's do a simple example first. Let's look at two vectors in R2, uh, so one, zero. One, one, this is a basis of R2. So this, let's say this is, these are the standard axes of R2. And then my vectors kind of look like this, right? This is X1, this is X2. This is not an orthonormal basis. It's a basis, but it's not orthogonal. The dot product is just one, right? Now, my, I want to convert this to an orthonormal basis. So there's a very natural approach to do this. So the natural idea is, well, okay, um, you know, they're not orthogonal. So I want to make them orthogonal without changing the span. So I'm going to replace one of the vectors, the second one, replace the second vector by some vector orthogonal to the first one without changing the span. Right, so, you know, I wouldn't, for example, I don't want to replace it by zero. That would destroy the property that the span is still R2, right? So there's a very natural candidate for doing this, right? So, okay, I'm transforming the basis X1, X2 into a new basis V1, V2. I'm not gonna do anything to X1, but I'm gonna do something interesting to X2. I'm gonna replace it by a vector that's the projection of X1 of X2, sorry, orthogonal to X1. Okay, so geometrically it's kind of clear, you know, this X2 has this, it, it, it's sort of not perpendicular to X1. So I just wanna keep the component of X2 that is perpendicular to X1, right? So that's gonna be my V2. And that's just gonna be this projection orthogonal to X1 of X2. And now, you know, algebraically, you know, what is that? Well, it's an orthogonal projection, right? So, so, so let's go back to the unique decomposition theorem, right? I want the projection onto X1 perp. Now this, it tells me that's just gonna be the original vector minus its projection onto W. In this case, W is the span of X1. So this will just be X2 minus 
the projection of x2 onto the span of x1. So that's x2 inner product x1 over x1 dot x1 times x1. And now, okay, so I can compute this. this is going to be one, one minus, so dot product is one over one times one, zero. And indeed you get zero, one. Okay, so, so I replaced x2 by something perpendicular to x1, and I didn't change the span. Why doesn't it change the span? So the key claim that the span doesn't change when I do this. Why is that? Um, well, the span of a vector in uh, in x one perp plus uh, the vector x one has to span r two, so we know that bo both sets of vectors are spanning r two. Uh, yeah, I think you're on the right track. I mean, roughly speaking, this is a set of linear combinations that look like this, right? Right. And this, what is this? This is a set of linear combinations of V1. V1 is just X1. And now V2 is itself a linear combination of X2 and some something else times V1, right? In this case, it's just X2 minus X1, right? But those two sets are the same because, because all you did was subtract off a multiple of X1, you didn't actually change the span. Okay, so this this doesn't change the span. This is a key property. If you take one of your vectors and so, uh, you know uh, uh, subtract the projection along the previous vector, that doesn't change the span. It's sort of geometrically clear as well. So, so the Gram-Schmidt algorithm is a gen is it just a boosted up version of this observation. So let me tell you what the algorithm is. Oh, actually, any more questions? Uh, I understood the process, but why would uh, C2 be distributed for both uh, X2 minus X1 if the projection equation shows X2 minus like, all? Uh, well, yeah, so I'm just using the V2 is literally equal to X2 minus X1 in this case, right? So this is V2, this is V1, right? Yeah. And all I'm trying to say is that, you know, if you look at all linear combinations of X1 and X2 minus X1, uh, in particular, that is that contains X2, right? You could set C1 equal to C2. But why wouldn't it be X2 minus CX1? Because I mean, isn't that what you're sort of doing? Uh, like, uh, like meaning, like I just don't understand why the C2 would distribute to the X2 and the X1 when the projection equation is like used because the dot product of x2 and x1 divided by the dot product of x1 by itself will not always be one. Correct, right? correct. This is specific to this example. So oh, okay, matter, I, see. Right? Yeah. I see, I see. In general, it'll be whatever it is. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me tell you the general algorithm and then it'll hopefully make more sense. So the, the general algorithm is the following. This is called the Gram-Schmidt algorithm. So the input to the algorithm is a basis of a subspace, x1 through xp, basis of a subspace w and rn. It may not be orthogonal. The output is an orthogonal basis of the same subspace. So uh, let's call it v1 through vp 
orthogonal bases. of W, same subspace. OK. And uh, what's the algorithm? Well, so step one, just fix the order of the vectors, order of the vectors. I mean, you don't, this is, you don't really have to do anything here. I'm just saying that the order actually matter. You know, you have to fix an order in advance. So OK. And now uh, step two is um, uh, replace x, k plus 1 by um, v, k plus 1 equals the projection orthogonal to the previous vectors of xk plus 1. Okay, so replace, just keep the part of that vector that's, you know, really not redundant in the sense that it's orthogonal to the span of the previous vectors. Okay, so you do this for k equals, you know, uh, 1 to, I guess, p minus 1. So, 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 you know, you repeat this, it's a loop. So, so the algorithm looks like this, right? You start, you have uh, um, x1. Well, what's the projection of x1 orthogonal to the previous vectors? There are no previous vectors. So just v1 is just equal to x1. Nothing happens. X2 is the first interesting vector. This gets mapped to V2, which is X2. And now this is the this is the sort of fun part. Uh, let's keep track of our uh, progress so far. So this is a partial orth orthogonal basis we've got so far. So far we just have V1. And uh, and 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 the you know the the key property that's maintained throughout the algorithm is that the span doesn't change the span of x1 through xk is equal to the span of v1 through vk so what that means is i have my v1 i can use that um to compute the projection of x2 orthogonal to span of x1, right? So this this will just be x2 minus x2 dot v1 over v1 dot v1 times v1. And then the, the third step, you really see the pattern. v3 has to be, you know, the algorithm is really described in this line, right? So v3 should be x3. But now you want to subtract off the component of x3 in the span of x1, x2. But by the time you get to step three, you actually have made progress because you have an orthogonal basis for the span of x1, x2. Right? So this is an orthogonal basis for span of x1, x2. Right? This is an orthogonal basis for span of x1. So once, since you have that, you can use the formula, right? You need the orthogonal basis to use the formula. So now here you'll get x3 dot v1 over v1 dot v1 times v1 minus x3 dot v2 over v2 dot v2 times v2 and so on. So that's the algorithm. You just project out the redundant part, but you know the, the sort of slick part of the algorithm is that you build because you're building up this orthogonal basis as you're going along. You get to use the formula. You get to use the nice formula every time. 
Okay, so you use your partial progress to make further progress. That's sort of the beauty of this algorithm. So that's a description of the algorithm. So any questions about the description? I'll do a numerical example on the next page. So this would be an orthogonal basis for span of x1, x2, x3. Yeah. Uh, yes, please um, go ahead. Huh? I had a question on the previous slide. Yep. Um, so you have like v2 is equal to the projection of x2 onto um, the span of x1 perp. Yep. Um, and then you write x2 minus what I thought was the projection formula. Like I thought that part after the minus was just the projection formula, not yeah. the whole thing or. Uh, right. So, so, so here I'm using, I'm using the projection formula onto the orthogonal complement. Right. So, 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 so what you're saying is that, uh, what you're saying correctly is that this is the projection onto the span of X one, right. Of X two. Okay. That's correct. But now if I want the projection on the perp, what do I do? We'll have to subtract it from X two. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Thank you. And there is an important difference in the actual algorithm from what I wrote here. So in the first step, you know, it, V1 is equal to X1. So it doesn't matter if you write V1 or X1 in the formula, but in the second step, it is important that you use V1 and V2 and not X1 and X2. So, so this is the only subtlety in this algorithm is that when you do the steps, these, these are not X1 and X2. These are V1 and V2. Why do they have to be V1 and V2? Like what would go wrong if I just used only Xs instead of using the Vs? V2 just isn't equal to X2 at that point? It's not equal to X2, that's right. But but why would you in general get garbage, right? So like, you're right, it's not equal to X2, but but why would you kind of get nonsense if you did that? Like what, what's the special property of V1 and V2 that we're using? They're orthogonal. They're orthogonal. And this formula only works for orthogonal vectors because the formula requires V1 orthogonal to V2, the projection formula. Okay, so the key properties, really two key properties are maintained. One is that the spans are the same and the other is that these are always orthogonal. So it, it's, it's really a sneaky trick, right? You maintain a partial list of orthogonal vectors that allows you to use the formula, which then allows you to produce more orthogonal vectors. That's the idea of the algorithm. So maybe this will become clearer if I, let me just run an example. Okay. But before that, any questions about the statement of the algorithm? Uh, yeah, yeah, if I, we, oh no, go ahead, you go first. All right. What What's the connection between what's in the red box and then the like X1, what you've written with the arrows? Uh, yeah, right. So th the connection is that, um, so maybe this will make it clear. Uh, this, um, uh, you know, this what's written here, this is just equal to X K plus one minus its projection onto the span of X one through X K of X K plus one. Okay. So the connection is that we're now, we want to compute um, the starred quantity, right? And that's what we're doing uh, here. We're computing the projection onto that span. Now, in general, it's not so easy to do that, right? You need an, ortho you need an orthogonal basis to use the projection formula. 
But the point is we have one, namely the Vs. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I, I guess I was wondering then why inside the red box, why isn't it like V K plus one equals X K plus one minus? Like, why isn't it what you've written in the blue? Instead, why, like, why was it just what you've written in the black at first? Those two are equal. It's both of them. Okay. Right, uh, so I mean, uh, they're equal. The reason I wrote it the first way is I wanted to emphasize that you're keeping the part orthogonal to what you had before. So in words, they're saying replace xk plus one by uh, its uh, projection orthogonal to previous vectors. Does that? Oh, sometimes yeah, yeah. conceptually, sometimes conceptually, that makes more sense, right? Yeah. That the I part see. you're keeping is the new part, and so you're subtracting out the old part, which is the yellow star. Yeah, I see. I missed the um, perp and, like perp sign. Yeah, the yeah. The perp. It's a little confusing. So let me just do an uh, a sort of numerical example. So let's say you have x1 equals 1, 0, 0, 0. x2 equals 1, 1, 0, 0. And x3 equals 1, 0, 3, 4. This is a basis of the span of these vectors. This is my w, which lives in R4. So when you run the algorithm, well, V1 is always just X1. V2 is gonna be the projection of X2 orthogonal to X1. So it's gonna be X2 minus, um, and I'm gonna use the Vs, so I can use the formula, minus X2 dot V1 over V1 dot V1 times V1, which is one, one, zero, zero minus, so X2 dot V1, so x1, this is just 1, 0, 0, 0, right? So it's going to be, uh, I'm just going to do the dot product in my head. So the numerator is going to be 1. The denominator is going to be 1 times this, which indeed is this 0, 1, 0, 0. So that's my v2. And now v3, the point is I'm going to bootstrap. I'm going to use my v1 and v2 to compute v3. This is x3 minus you know, the projection of x3 in the span of the previous two vectors, which is the same as the span of v1 and v2. So I'll have this formula. And now, you know, I have my V2 in my hand, right? So I can now write this out. So X3 dot V1 is just uh, one. V1 dot V1 is one. So times, oh, sorry, I missed writing X3 itself. So I have X3, one, zero, three, four, minus one over one times one, zero, 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 minus, and now X3 dot V2. So V2 is this vector here, right? X3 dot V2. Um, is actually just zero. And okay, V2 dot V2 is one. And so you just get uh, zero, zero, three, four. And indeed, this is an orthogonal basis, you can check. So it's not, not a complicated algorithm, it just has a sneaky trick of using the partial orthogonal basis as you go along. Any questions about this? Um, I have a question about the last slide, actually, just mm -hmm. um, some of your writing. Um, so at the beginning, we said the input was x1 through xp, but yep. then in the key properties, we only talk about x1 through xk and v1 through vk. Good, good. So this is so th this is for all k. For k equals one through uh, through p. Right, so p is the total number of vectors, mm -hmm. but k k is like at step k, 
you're looking at k vectors, right? At step one, you're looking at one vector. At step two, you're looking at two vectors. Oh, uh, okay. So the key property is saying at every step, the spans are preserved and the mm -hmm. Vs you produce so far are orthogonal. Okay, so like the biggest K is P. The biggest K is P, correct. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Yep. Um, looking at the example on, I guess it was the next slide. Mm -hmm. It kind of looks like we're losing variables, I guess, as we go along. Is that intentional or is that just as a result of this example? That's just in this example. I just wanted to make my calculations easy. You don't generally lose, you don't generally get zeros when you do this. Okay, thank you. Yeah. When you do the homework, you'll see that other things can happen. Any more questions? I see some questions in the chat, actually quite a few. So if somebody wants to ask any. Okay, somebody asked a good question, right? So um, VK plus one is orthogonal to all the previous VKs, right? By the red box up there, right? That's why you get orthogonality because you all every new vector you produce is orthogonal to all of the previous ones. But then that means every pair is orthogonal, right? So the reason for this is property two is just contained in the red box. Everything is implied by what's in the red box. Okay. Um, Anything else? Can you go back to the previous slide for yep. one second? Um, professor, just to clarify, is VK plus one orthogonal to all the other Vs before that or all the Xs before that? A great question. So the answer is both. So VK plus one is orthogonal to all the X's before that. In fact, it's orthogonal to their span, right? Mm -hmm. But remember the span of the X's, X1 through XK is equal to the okay. span of V1 through VK. Okay. Thank you. So therefore, you know, this is, it must be orthogonal to all the V's as well. That's how you get the second property. Is the only exception to that V1 not being orthogonal to X1? Or is you, are you saying that V2 is orthogonal to X1? V2 is orthogonal to X1. Because the definition of V2 is it's a component of some vector orthogonal to X1. So it's, you know, by definition, it's orthogonal to X1. Um, can you explain again why the two spans are equal? Yeah, so uh, the, the two spans being equal, I'm not gonna do a formal proof, it's a proof by induction, if you know what that is. Um, the formal proof is, is this type of reasoning here, right? That when you convert the X's into V's, what are you actually doing? Well, you're just taking a linear combination of, let's say X, K plus one, with a bunch of the previous VKs, right? But all of those, uh, all previous VIs, but all of those are, you know, they, they lie in the span of the previous X size. So there's no way you can actually make the span uh, bigger or smaller just by taking a, you know, by taking a linear combination with the previous vectors. That's the proof. So you're right, I didn't do a, full, a rigorous proof. I kind of just did a proof by example. It's okay. this reasoning here. Okay. Yeah. Formally, you have to approve by induction, but that's not part of the prerequisite for the course. So. So each. Uh, so by that reasoning, so like each. Mm, how do I explain this? So. Like each little segment behind, like the x two or the x three. Mm -hmm. Are those like also? Let me let me think about this real quick. Yeah. 
yeah i mean i mean you know the 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 picture of it is something like you know you start off with these x's right of x1 x2 x3 x4 x5 and you slowly turn these into v's right mm -hmm. but the point is when you're going from the x to the v you end up using all of the previous v's in the formula and all the previous v's are in some form related to the x's yeah but what the thing that's maintained is that all the initial segments of this like th these two these three these four these are all orthogonal bases. Okay. Or, or orthogonal sets, let's just say. Orthogonal bases for the span. Yeah. Okay. So I guess I'm going a little slow, so let I won't be able to finish regression, but I'll at least be able to start telling you what it is. And we'll finish it next time. So yeah, I thought you were talking about least squares. Is that the same thing? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. In this course, it's called least squares. Yeah, least squares. OK, fine. Yeah. It's the same thing. So, so how to, how how to introduce this? So, um, uh, so so far, um, given a linear system, so you know you have some M by N matrix A. There have really been only two outcomes. So either B is in the column space of A, in which case we say the system is consistent, or it's not in the column space of A, in which case we say it's inconsistent. Right? In the first case, there's a solution. In the second case, there's not. But in real life, you often don't satisfy solutions exactly, but you almost satisfy them. So in many real applications, Um, B is near the column space without being in it. Okay. So the picture is something, well, I'll draw a picture on the next slide. And so this is what uh, leads to the definition of a least square solution. So it's a generalized notion of solving a linear system. Here's the definition. So a uh, least square solution. Can you explain what near means? Uh, I'm just going to write it just now. Yeah. Okay. It's minimizing distance. So least square solution of AX equals B is a vector X hat, which lives in RN for an M by N matrix A. Uh, which minimizes the distance of B to AX hat. And traditionally, you square it. That's the same as minimizing the distance. OK, so what does that mean? That means that, um, you know, uh, it means that uh, this B minus AX hat is as small as possible. It's less than B minus AX for every X. Okay. So, th so the key concept here is minimizing this quantity. And this quantity is called the least squares error. You'll see, I mean, okay, if you write out what this number is, it's a sum of squares. So it's natural to, that's why it's called the least squares. And this is, you know, this is not an equation whose solution, this is really a fundamentally different concept from what we did earlier in the course. This is really an optimization problem, right? We're minimizing something. We're not just asking, hey, I want to solve some algebra. We want to find the minimizer of this quantity. 
and I, you know, I should, should make a preliminary remark that if a system is consistent, um, then uh, then what would this error? What would the minimum error be? Zero. Yeah, zero. Is zero right for a solution? For an exact solution. So. The way to think about this is being consistent means the error is zero, but if the error is something really tiny, you know that could still be useful, and in, indeed it's very useful. So that's the definition of a least square solution. It's a new solution concept. Okay, it's like the best you can do without maybe necessarily exactly solving the equations, but it's the best you can do in a particular sense. Any questions about the definition? Um, so, so this is like not the correct solution, but kind of like the best we can get. Yeah, this 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 is not this is not this is not, this is not a, this doesn't solve the so this should be had just to be clear. This doesn't actually solve the equation. Okay. Okay. It just minimizes the least squares error. And okay, you know, there's always something that minimizes the least square error. And so, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, Thank and you. so you can this you can always find something that does this. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so let me now show you a picture, which is helpful to me for how to think about what this means, because right now it's just you know some minimization problem. So, 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 what's the what's the picture associated with this? I, this picture is very important for conceptualizing what's going on. So, what are you given? Well, you're given an M by N matrix A, and you're given a vector B, as we have been given or much earlier in the course. And the least square problem, the least square solution, again, is to find x hat in R n, minimizing. This b minus a x hat squared. Now, what what does this actually look like? Well, okay, let's uh, let's think about what this error means geometrically. So there's a subspace. Okay, so first of all, there's a vector in R m which is called b, right? So this is a picture of R m. And the thing we're minimizing is the distance of b to a x hat, right? We're, now, what what is the set of all a x hat? Well, it's actually just the column space of a. So, column space of a is the set of all a x hat, such that x hat is an R n. So, this number that we're minimizing is actually a distance. The so distance of B to this vector AX, uh, sorry, AX hat, which you know lives in the column space of A by definition. So the dotted line, the square of that distance is what's being minimized. But now the X hat that we're looking at actually lives somewhere else, right? So it lives in RN. So somewhere here there's RN. And there's an X hat in here. And what the matrix is doing is it's mapping this X hat to a vector in the column space, A X hat. And so the thing you're looking for is this X hat such that when, when you look at its image, A X hat, that is the closest possible thing to B. Okay, so that's the picture I associate with this and you know this dotted line is equal to b minus a x hat the uh, the dotted line okay maybe that arrow is unnecessary but okay that wasn't such a good idea but uh you know this or maybe let me just make it red that'll make it or i've already used red let me make it blue so this blue vector 
is b minus a x hat. So often people get confused about where these, what the picture that goes with this is. And it's a little confusing because you know you you have to think about both R and N R M at the same time. But it's really a combination of concepts that we're all quite familiar with by now. Professor. Yep. Why? I don't know if you already said this, but why is it squared? Like, I mean, like I guess if it was negative, that would be a problem. But like, can we also just say like we want to minimize the absolute value? Of yeah. The no, you're right. That's fine. So it's just squared because people don't like writing square roots. Okay. Right. So remember the what is the formula for this, right? So yeah, maybe it'll this will make it clear. Let me just put a little bubble here. B minus a x hat norm squared. Well, you know this is summation b i minus the i th entry of a x hat squared, right? That's just what a squared norm is. And the only reason for the square is otherwise you'd have to take a square root and people don't want to write a square root. There's really nothing more than that. Okay. okay so if you don't like the square, you can remove it, but it's just going to make your life a little more annoying because you're going to have to take square roots. Okay. So this is the picture associated with least square and this picture tells us how to find the least square solution. Okay, so I'm going to present two methods for finding the solution. So there's going to be a two-step method and a one-step method. So two-step method. The two-step method is just to combine what we did already, right? So let's call this um, this a x hat. Let's call this b hat, right? Can anybody tell me what b hat is in terms of concepts we've already studied in the course? Uh, it would just be the projection or the orthogonal projection of B into uh, the Wethold column space of A. Exactly, yeah. So just uh, you know, find B hat in the column space of A, minimizing B minus B hat the norm squared. This would just be an orthogonal projection. So just be the projection onto the column space of A of B. And then what would you do? You're not done yet, right? Because now you found the you found B hat, but we wanted X hat. How, how are you going to find X hat? Would we just do like row reduction for A X yeah, hat? Yeah, just do row reduction. And why is that system consistent, by the way? We know that B is in, or we know that what we found B hat, right, is in R, R of M. Uh, you know more than that. You know it's in the column space of A. Right, so you need, right, for the system to be consistent, you need B hat to be in the column space of A. And that's what you guaranteed by step one. So you could do that and that would work. So this is like a combo of two types of problems that we learned how to solve in one. One is finding the closest vector in the column space and, the, and then the other is finding a vector in the domain that maps to that vector in the column space, x hat. But there's actually a one step method which is one of the surprises or sort of nice things about this. The one step method is based on observations from this lecture and the previous lecture. What's the observation? Well, B hat is optimal. So it's the closest vector in, you know, in the column space of A to B, if and only if, Let's go back to our first slide, right? The orthogonal projection 
satisfies two properties, best approximation and unique decomposition. And these are equivalent, right? If you go back to the previous lecture, that's how we derived these properties. So the being the closest vector is actually equivalent to an algebraic condition. It's equivalent to B minus B hat is in the column space of a perp. That's by the previous lecture. Any questions about that step? Um, can you explain that again really quick? Sure. So th this I'm referring to something from the previous lecture, which is when you find the closest vector to B in a subspace, that's always the vector that you get. Uh, I mean, that's equivalent to finding the vector so that the uh, error B, B minus B hat is orthogonal to the subspace you care about. So there's a fancy way of saying that the closest point is this point you get by dropping a perpendicular. Thank you. Yeah, so in the last lecture, you know, we did this little calculation that the closest point is the one so that this is true. Okay, but now let's uh, think about what this means, right? Now, what does it mean to be orthogonal to column space of A? Let's let's say A has columns A1 through AN. So if you want to be orthogonal to the columns of A, it's enough to be orthogonal to each column, right? By linearity. If you're orthogonal to every column, then you're going to be orthogonal to all of the linear combinations of them. So this is equivalent to saying B minus B hat dot AI is equal to zero, or just the number zero, sorry, in this case. For all of these vectors. So it's a dot product. And, and actually, let me write it as a transpose. Right, if you're orthogonal to all the columns of A, that means AI dot B minus B hat is zero. So you get a bunch of equations, you get N equations. Any questions about that step? Can you explain that again? Sure. So here I'm using that uh, I'm using that in order to be in the column space of A, and to be in the orthogonal complement of the column space of A. The column space of A is the span of these vectors, right? Oh, never mind. I was yeah. confused on where yeah. AI was coming from. Okay. Yeah, AI are the columns of the matrix A. I've defined them. So to be, a, you have to be perpendicular to all of them. So all these dot products have to be zero. So now you get a bunch of equations. So now I'm going to write this in matrix notation. It's the same as saying a transpose times this vector b minus. And now what's b hat? Well, b hat is a x hat, right? B hat is a x hat. So let this be the case. This is true if and only if this is true. I'm just stacking these N equations into a single matrix equation. Because, okay, what are the rows of A transpose? Anybody say what the rows of A transpose are? The columns of A. The columns of A, but transposed as row vectors, right? So A transpose is this matrix, A1 transpose to A n transpose, and that's an n by m matrix, right? So now if I just stack these, so this is in life, this is a good advice. If you see a bunch of equations, stack them into a matrix. You, you will like discover what it means. It, it's much more, it's much better, okay? So it's just stack them into one matrix and get one matrix equation. And now that's just one equation, right? I can solve that. I can just rearrange it to maybe make my life a little easier. That's just the equation A transpose AX hat 
equals A transpose B, which is just a linear system. So that's a one step, one equation. I mean, I have to do some matrix multiplication. So this is called the normal equations for the least squares problem. And uh, you know, I can just solve that equation and that will, because all these things are if and only if, that will, the solutions of that will be the least square solutions. So it's kind of you know because I was because of the, the key step is is this this is the best approximation theorem the key step is that that allows you to turn an optimization problem into just a bunch of equations which then end up being linear equations so to solve these squares the conceptually the key thing to remember is this picture but you know there are two different methods one is just to combine these two steps, but there's a slick way, which is to do it in one step. So let me just write a summary of this. Summary is uh, the least square solution, or not the, we, we didn't say it's unique, right? There, there may be many such X hat. So least squares solutions X hat of AX equals B uh, are given by uh, you know, solutions of A transpose AX hat equals A transpose B. Okay, uh, so by the so way, why is this system always consistent? Right, so maybe look back on the slide. Look at these normal equations down here. I said, oh, you can, you know, I said you can reduce least squares, which always has a solution to this linear system. Why is that system always consistent? Okay, so there are many ways to see it, but actually the most conceptual way is already written here, right? So the system is consistent if and only if there is a least square solution, right? But there's always a least square solution, right? I mean, there is always some X hat, which achieves the minimum. There is always some closest vector B hat, right? Like the two-step method, proves that there's always some solution, but then that means that the one-step method also has some solution. So these normal equations are always consistent, right? Because the two-step method always has a solution. So a corollary of what we just did, which is not obvious, that the normal equations are always consistent. Okay, and uh, you know, uh, yeah. Okay, so I, you know, I was going to do an application. I'll do an application next time. It's actually an application related to COVID that is, I guess, has been going on for a year at this point. But um, next time, I'll show you how we can use this to analyze actual data. Uh, but that's least squares. Um, and yeah, I guess that's it for today. Oh yeah, people asked, there is a quiz tomorrow. It's gonna cover the week before the spring break. And I'll release midterm uh, information today. I'll send an email, but yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, anybody have any more questions? Um, professor, I have a question about mm -hmm. um, when we were trying to turn 
a regular basis into an orthogonal basis. Yep. Um, could you do a visualization when the basis um, contains like three vectors, like we did for two vectors? Sure. So let, let's try to do that. My drawing skills are not the best, but let's try. So, uh, okay, let me draw a frame of reference. So three three dimensional space. And let's suppose I have some three vectors. So let's say X1 is here for simplicity. Let's say X2 is here. And let's say X3, yeah, my drawing. <laughs> okay, I, I don't want it to be in the span of these three. So let's see, so what's the best way to, okay, let's, let's, you know, wait, so that, I'm sorry, so, I did teach math 53, so there's a way to make it look 3D, right? Uh, what do you do? Maybe you drop, yeah, maybe, maybe you do this, right? So, so you draw a vector in this plane and then you go up and then you have, sorry, that's like a really bad picture. Um, okay, let's try again. So yeah, so 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 let's say that's you know that's this let's say this is a, these are three vectors. So it's still a bad picture, but okay. So so what do you do in step one? In step one, you replace x two by its component orthogonal to x one. So x one is equal to v one. X two is e x two is replaced by v two. Okay. And now in step three, what do you do? So x three is this this vector that's sticking out here, right? On step three, you replace x3 by its span orthogonal to the span of the previous vectors, which is this whole plane. Okay? So in this case, you would end up replacing it by this coordinate. And you know the key is that you have this 90 degree angle. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have another question. Mm -hmm. So if we were to do this in like with like higher dimensions, what would they look like? Well, right. I guess so, um, so this, so some people can visualize four dimensions. I I can't. Uh, the sort of nice thing, in my experience, is that our three dimensional intuition about this actually is correct in four dimensions, even though we can't actually draw it. If, like if you th if you think about it this way, like let's say you think about, you know, what's the intuition here? The intuition here is that you're keeping the component of each vector orthogonal to the span of the previous ones, right? And you have some 3D picture of that. And, you know, th that gives you some, well, it has, that intuition has some consequences, right? Like for example, let's say X3 was in the span of X1 and X2, right? Then, then what would the uh, what would v three be? Wait, you said uh, x three was in the span of x one and x two. Yeah. Let's, so let's say I gave you something that's not a basis, right? Okay. So question: If x one, x two, x three are not a basis, uh, then then what happens? Well, then one of the vectors has to be in the other two, right? Or... One of the vectors has to be in the span of the other two, right? But then what'll what'll happen when you do Gram Schmidt? What'll happen to the V vector that you get in that step? Then you get something that's in the same. Right. So same. let's say you have x1, x2, and then you have uh, you know, for some reason you have this vector x3, which is in the span, right? Mm -hmm. So now when you compute the when you compute v3. Uh, well, that's the component of X3 orthogonal to the span of X1 and X2. What's it going to be? Okay, so X1 is the same direction. X2 is perpendicular to the plane. And then you have X3 that's... No, no, no. X, X2 is in the plane. So in this picture, X1 and X2 span the plane. Uh, sorry, uh, V1, V2, I bet. Oh, sorry. Are you oh. looking at the 3D picture or the 2D picture? 
Okay, okay. Now I'm looking at the 2D one. Yeah, so let's say, let's look at the 2D picture. And let's say this little parallelogram that's drawn over here, this is the span of X1 and X2, right? And let's okay. say X3 is in the span of X1 and X2, right? Now, what is V3 gonna be? I'm not sure. Okay, uh, what's the projection of X3 onto the span of X1 and X2? Uh, the span of X3 onto the... Uh, no, no, no. Uh, so what's the projection onto the span of X1 and X2 of X3 in this example? What's the closest vector in the span of X1 and X2 to X3? This, the closest, wouldn't that just be X3? Yeah, just X3. So uh, what's V3 in that case? Wouldn't it be the same thing? No, V3 is the projection orthogonal to the span of X1 and X2 of X3. So what would that be? I mean, okay, the intuition here is V3 is the part of X3 that sticks out of that plane, right? Right. So it's what is that part? Zero. Zero, yeah. So, you know, there's this geometric intuition that what you're doing in the algorithm is you're keeping the part that sticks out of the span of the previous vectors. And in okay. 3D, you have some intuition, right? That if you have three collinear line segments, then you know that thing is zero. And I'm just saying that that plays out in the algebra and that also works in higher dimensions. So roughly speaking, this intuition is, is useful even in higher, higher dimensions. I don't have a better way of visualizing it than, than this. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. So anyway, the answer to this question is uh, you get V, get V3 equals zero, or you get some VK equals zero. And so Gram Schmidt gets stuck. Which makes sense. You shouldn't be able to produce an orthogonal basis out of something that's not a basis. Any other question? Um, I have a question about the one step method. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I I don't know why the we get the like a transpose b minus b hat equals to zero. Oh, okay. Uh, so so here I'm just using that I'm just using here that a i dot b minus b hat is equal to zero. Is that something you believe? Uh, it, but like A, A is the linear transformation matrix. Right, but A, A, I are the columns of A. So maybe importantly, you have to look here, right? So A, I are the vectors that are the columns of A. Uh -huh, then how can we know they are Perpendicular? Uh, they, no, they aren't. Yeah. <laughs> no, they're not perpendicular to each other, but they're perpendicular to B minus B hat because of the previous thing that's written, right? So by the best approximation property, B minus B hat is orthogonal to everything in the column space of A, right? So what does this mean? This means, this means that, I don't know, W dot B minus B hat equals zero for every W in the column space of A, right? Mm -hmm. And in particular that the AIs are in the column space of A because they're the columns of A, right? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, and so, and you know, and that's if and only if, because if you're orthogonal to all the columns, then you're also orthogonal to any linear combination of them. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, no, you're right. It's a, 
there's a lot happening in that arrow. So yeah, mm -hmm. good question. Um, I have a question on the same place. Mm -hmm. Like I was one step method. Um, why is it T instead of dot? Uh, well, I just wanted to write it that way because then I then I then it's sort of easier to see why it's um, um, A transpose the matrix times that vector. So it, it, I've written it that way. It just I mean, you could write dot, but it's just to make it hopefully easier to understand this step. Oh, does that mean transposing is the same as dot or? Yeah. Like like a, a, if you have a vector, so this is just this sort of matrix algebra that you'll have to sort of check that if you have a matrix and you you take its transpose and multiply that by a vector, you just get the vector of dot products with the rows. So we all, we actually already did this trick earlier in the lecture when we talked about this, right? It's the same trick we did when we wrote y dot u1, et cetera, as u1 transpose all the way to up transpose times y. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.